Welcome to Sparks of History, where Jewish history and world history meet. We are very honored to have with us today Professor Dara Horn, author of People Love Dead Jews. Uh, today's interview is taking place just days after the horrific, shocking massacre and pogrom here in Israel on the Sabbath and Simchat Torah holiday. And while Professor Horn and I were both hesitant to conduct this discussion today, to go on with business as usual, we decided that the topic, people love dead Jews, was important and relevant. Um, so first, we extend our tanfumim, our condolences to the families of those who lost their loved ones, uh, pray for the safe and speedily return of all hostages, and beseech uh, Almighty God, the guardian of Israel, to protect our brave IDF soldiers. Uh, Professor Horn, um, as an introduction, uh, earned her BA in Comparative Literature from Harvard University and an MA in Hebrew Literature from Cambridge University, and then back to Harvard for a PhD in Hebrew and Yiddish. Professor Horn is an award-winning novelist, essayist, and professor of literature, having taught at universities such as St. Lawrence, Sarah Lawrence College, Sydney University of New York, Harvard and Yeshiva University. Uh, she has been a contributor to the New York Times and to the Atlantic and has written five award-winning fiction novels in The Image, The World to Come, All Other Nights, A Guide for the Perplexed, and Eternal Life. And as mentioned previously, we were discussing Professor Oren's first nonfiction work, People Love Dead Jews, a uh, report from a haunted past, which was a winner of the National Haunted Present. Literature. What? Haunted Present. Yes. I'm yeah. sorry. Haunted Present. Okay. Which maybe that was my wish. Uh, <laughs> yes. Which was, which was the winner of the National uh, Jewish Book Award. And again, Professor Horn, thank you. I know it's a, a difficult time and appreciate um, uh, your being with us today. Thank you for having me. Okay. We have prepared a, you know, a whole list of questions, you know, that's set it on the book. Was there anything else you wanted to start off with, and you know, in light of, of, of the events? I mean, I, what is it sort of astonishing to me is how familiar it all feels. I'm a scholar of Yiddish literature. Um, you know, I know a lot of people were talking about, oh, this is like the Yom Kippur War, but it's, I mean, it's not like the Yom Kippur War. What it is like is every Yiddish document I've ever read about not only the Shoah, but also um, the pogroms of 1919 to 1921, uh, pogroms of 1905, um, also documents about like the Farhud uh, in Iraq. Um, about um it's there's there's a sort of like it's very clear in yiddish literature and i think that it really comes through in yiddish literature in a way that i have not seen in a lot of other languages um the gleeful sadism of these attacks is what feels familiar um and you know i don't want to go into these details which all of us know um but it is those same details that you find in, you know, Yiddish testimony about, you know, pogroms in 1919. I mean, it's like astonishingly similar. And, um, and I mean, and also like even in Yiddish testimony about the Shoah, which is very different from, you know, what you read in other languages, um, which is tends to avoid those things. Um, you know, you see this sort of incredibly gleeful sadism, but it's also I mean, but that's something that we also, you know, it feels familiar from like, you know, the uh, the 10 martyrs in the uh, from Hazal in uh, the Roman period, right? I mean, it's just like the sort of, you know, the publicizing of the sort of sadistic uh, attacks. I mean, that's like, I mean, when they were executing the rabbis in Herzliya, it was in the, in, it was in the Hippodrome. Right. I mean, and that's what you see in, um, you know, and there's you know people taking photographs and, and I mean, now, 
you know, people are now live streaming these attacks and sort of that, you know, I mean, and that even was like reminded me even of an attack that was, you know, 100 years ago here in the United States, like when uh, Leo Frank was uh, was murdered people not only they didn't just take pictures of the hanging but they turned those pictures into postcards so they mailed around the united states and there's sort of this um gleefulness to this that is um you know a hallmark of this hatred and is really is really glaring and obvious um and you know, and there's just what I've noticed though, it's like there's a lot, I mean, you even see it in, I mean, it's even in Eicha. And, you know, that's sort of what I, I keep thinking about, but I also sort of keep thinking about um, the connections that you have for, you know, call Am Yisrael in all of these attacks. I mean, I was at a, a gathering in my community, I live in New Jersey, um, this was just my town where it was, you know, they, um, it was in my town, but it was for neighboring towns, but it was, you know, a gathering for the Jewish community where, I mean, we had about 2000 people there. Um, and I just, you know, remember, I mean, they had these kinds of gatherings in the 1930s, <laughs> it was like, um, you know, but also they had these kinds of gatherings like for, you know, freeing Soviet Jews. Right. I mean, and, and these, you know, there's sort of the, you know, these kinds of connections between diaspora and. Jewish communities and, you know, a lot of these, even the same organizations, you know, like the Joint Distribution Committee, uh, Committee and things like that existed in the past. And, um, you know, even thinking about, you know, communities in Eretz Israel and Bavel in ancient times and how they supported each other. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of amazing to me, um, you know, in the consistency, not only of the sadistic attacks, but also the consistency of the support and care that we give to each other at these times um so those are uh you know i wish i had something more uh no, more no, inspiring no, to no. offer but uh no, these no. are some of the things that are going through my yeah, mind absolutely. And, uh, that's, that's, uh, we'll try to uh you know uh, respond to all of this and uh i mean i can just tell you how intimately american jews are feeling this and 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 how urgently american jews are responding to this in any way we possibly can so i just want to uh yeah you know, as an american jew speaking to you know uh listeners from many different parts of the jewish community around the world i just want to point that out in this moment and you know um lean on that um you know solidarity we have with each other and and care and support for each other it's it's just it's just critical. It's you know it's it's you know every call that we get here in Israel from you know the states or Canada or it's just it's 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 very helpful. It really is. It's not only just appreciated. It's helpful. You just want you want to speak to people. You know you don't want to speak too much. You know you don't want to get into the details and you don't want to get into all the other nonsense. You just want to share. You know be be you know everyone should that one should just feel a part as you said of, of the Jewish people. What is what is the thesis behind um, people love dead Jews? How does it fit into this whole picture of what's not just what, what's happening now, obviously, and what's what's just generally happening around the world, the United States, etc. So this book is so it's quite different from what we were just uh, discussing in terms of the solidarity of the Jewish community, because this isn't a book about sort of the internal dynamics so much of Jewish communities. This is a book about the role that dead Jews play in a wider world's imagination. And there are, I mean, and, and the, ultimately the thesis is that the only way that um, a lot of non-Jewish societies know to, or understand to accept um, you know, to to accept Jews as if Jews are powerless, whether that means politically impotent or dead. And there's sort of like two um, parallel arguments that run through the book, which is um, the book is a collection of essays that are, you know, sort of taking place in many different settings and time periods. Um, and it's each one is sort of me investigating these different um, places and times of this dynamic. But the basic argument of the book is twofold. It's that people, and again, speaking about the role of Jews in a non-Jewish society specifically. Um, one side of it is that people tell stories about dead Jews that make them feel better about themselves. 
And the other sort of the other side of that coin is that living Jews are expected to erase themselves in order to gain public respect. So um, I can sort of dive into the dynamic now, um, or I mean, if you want, I can sort of explain how I came to this. Uh, you know, Absolutely, this... yes. Uh, how you know? Uh, again, your background is literature. Yes, and I mean in literature, but specifically Jewish literature. So I, you know, I talked, I, I spoke a few minutes ago about Yiddish literature, but I, you know, studied Yiddish and modern Hebrew literature is also my field. Um, so sort of Haskalah onward. Um, and and Yiddish literature, you know, a lot of those writers are were working in both languages, um, but and also and it's not just that you know my academic work is in literature, but I also I'm a novelist. So my first this is my first nonfiction book. My five previous books are all novels, and my and I want to point out though that I I I spent twenty years not writing this book, and essentially avoiding this topic. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, I spent, you know, the past for the tw past 20 years writing my novels, all of which I, to be clear, all my novels deal very deeply with Jewish history and literature and, and culture and, and uh, belief and and texts. Um, I mean, you know, like I have a novel where Ramam is a character. I have a novel where Yochanan ben Zakkai is a character. I mean, and they all sort of have these intertwining contemporary plots. And I mean, that's the kind of books I write. They're very, very deep into um, into Jewish life. And I have taught, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Jewish literature, mostly Hebrew and Yiddish literature at many in many different uh, university settings. In all of my work as a writer and a scholar, it was always really important to me to tell the story of Jewish civilization really from the inside. And I was very much pushing back against the idea that you um, often encounter in you know, diaspora settings like where I live, where which is that that this is a culture that's defined by these external attacks. And I was so adamant about this as a younger writer that I would I when I would do book events for my novels, I often would ask the people at the book event, you know, in some bookstore, uh, I would often ask the audience, you know, how many people here can name three concentration camps? And you know, that's something that a lot of people in an American bookstore can probably do. I would add, then ask those same readers, how many people here can name three Yiddish writers? And not so many people can do that in an American bookstore. And you know, by raising that question, of course, what I was saying is, you know, specifically to the Shoah, um, to the Holocaust, there's, I mean, 80% of the people murdered in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers, 80%. And there's a very literary culture. So I'm really asking this question of why do we care so much how these people died if like, we really don't care how these people lived. And this started to change for me about five years ago. So I'm, I've been rambling a bit. Should I? No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Like, it's sort fine. Of yeah. So, um, so about five years ago, it was in 2018. I was uh, an American magazine, Smith uh, General Interest magazine called Smithsonian. It's like you know, kind of a history and culture magazine. Um, they contacted me and they asked me to write a long form, like you know, one of these 5,000 or more word long form essay for them about Anne Frank. And I got that request and I just felt so like overwhelmed with dread because I was like, oh God, I don't really want to write this essay for these people about Anne Frank, you know, for this like vast non-Jewish readership. I'm like, this is what they want me to write about. And, you know, the normal thing to do would have been to turn the assignment down. And instead I just thought, sort of thought like, well, this is interesting, right? Why do I, I'm an English language writer. You know, this is my field is, you know, Jewish culture and history, you know, not history so much, but culture and literature. I'm like, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that I would want to do this? And that's when I remembered this news story that I had read about in the, of something that had happened at the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam that year. And people who have read the book will have, will be familiar with this story. It was about a, uh, there was a young Jewish man who was working at that museum at the time. And the museum would not let him wear his kippah to work. They made him hide it under a baseball hat. Uh, the he complained about this to the board of the museum, and the board of the museum then deliberated for six months, and then finally relented and let him wear his yarmulke to work. And as I put it in the book, six months is a really long time for the Anne Frank Museum to ponder whether or not it was a good idea to force a Jew into hiding. And you know, I remembered reading this news story, and I thought, like, did I dream this? Because yeah, you know, I'm like, this can't possibly have happened. I looked it up. Not only did I not dream it, but something almost almost identical had happened 
a few months earlier in 2017 at the same museum, which was that at that time visitors noticed something weird about the audio guide display. It's a big international museum. They get millions of visitors from around the world. And you know, when you go to a museum and there are those audio guides in different languages and there's, and it tells you what languages they are and it says English and there's a little British flag and it says Francais and there's a little French flag and Espanol and there's a Spanish flag until you get to Hebrew. And for Hebrew, they didn't have a flag. And I'm just like, at that point, I'm like, you know, these are PR mishaps, but they're not mistakes. Right. They're not mistakes. And at that point, I went back to Smithsonian Magazine, this, you know, very general interest magazine for, you know, millions of non-Jewish Americans. And I told them, you know what, I think I will write that piece for you. And it was not the piece they expected because I, uh, the first line of that piece was, people love dead Jews, living Jews, not so much. And, you know, I thought I was sort of over this topic at that point. I was like, I'm getting this out of my system and now I'm going to go back to writing novels. And the problem is that piece came out in one of their 2018 issues. And this was it was in, in one of their 2018 fall issues. And it was just like a few days after that piece came out that there was the uh, shooting at the uh, shul in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the New York Times called me and was like, oh, would you like to write about dead Jews? I mean, they didn't say it that way, but that was really what they meant. And then six months later, there's another shooting at a shul in San Diego in California. And they call me again. As I put it, I, I, I became like the go to person for The New York Times emerging literary genre of shul shooting op eds. And I'm like, you know, I didn't apply for this job. And at that point, I just thought I what I realized is that there's there's these uncomfortable moments. In all of our lives. And when you're a writer, what you realize is that those uncomfortable moments are where the story is. Because like when you get to that moment that you don't, you know, where there's something so uncomfortable that you can't even talk about it, that's when you're about to learn something. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna, I've been avoiding this topic for 20 years and I'm just gonna dive into it. And I just saw this incredibly consistent pattern um, I mean, I traveled around the world. I went to all the you know Jewish heritage sites and you know things like that. And uh, but also you know sort of investigated this problem in lots of different aspects of history and culture. And it was just so unbelievably consistent. And I just you know the the unrelenting conclusion is that these non-Jewish societies are only happy with Jews if they're if they're powerless, and it or you know which means politically impotent or dead and also only satisfied with them if they erase themselves. So to hide their yarmulke under a baseball hat. Um, and I have more, a lot more I could say about that, but I've been, uh, yeah, I've been rambling a bit, but yeah, so that was how I, I yeah, sort of, funny. you know, unintentionally ended up um, exploring this topic that I really had been, I myself had been avoiding it. The, the, the issue with, with, with Anne Frank goes, if I remember correctly in reading, goes beyond the particular incidents that happen now. I mean, Anne, Anne Frank obviously resonates among non-Jews, like, you know, among Jews and non-Jews. And is there something that bothers you about, um, you know, the attitude towards the Anne Frank story? And, the, and the, I, I'll be honest with you, you know, my, my wife is, is a child of Holocaust survivors. I'm a child of a Holocaust survivor. We, we were talking about this and it was like, okay, you know, uh, you know, my father was in hiding, you know, uh, living as a Christian and my mother-in-law was in hiding for four years. I mean, it's, 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 it's an important story, but it, it's, you know, it's one, like we've never been impressed with, and maybe that's wrong. I don't know. It's not, it's not something that, you know, it doesn't speak to us that much in terms of, you know, it's one story out of millions of stories. So what, 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 what was troubling, what's troubling you about the Anne Frank phenomenon, uh, aside from, you know, the fact that the museum, you know, made this ridiculous decisions? Because the ridiculous decision the museum made is entirely consistent with the way this story has been used for now 60 years or 70 years. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Um, there's a lot of aspects to this, um, but, you know, first of all, you know, if you think about that, I mean, that book is the by far the most, you know, widely read book about the Holocaust by far. Um, and it's not a book about the Holocaust. It ends before <laughs> she gets murdered. It's not about the Holocaust. It's, you know, about this, frankly, unbelievably rare situation of 
someone who actually was helped by non-Jewish neighbors, which was unfortunately statistically insignificant number of people who had that experience, um, disproportionately uh, represented in survivors uh, as you, you know, like your, perhaps like your relatives, but I mean, statistically insignificant, number one. Number two, um, this was a highly, uh, you know, and Frank and her family are highly atypical victims of the Holocaust. I mentioned before 80% of the people murdered in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers. Yeah, these are people who are not speaking a Jewish language. Um, so really large, I, I forget the numbers, but enormous number of Holocaust victims were uh, religious Jews, uh, various versions of religious Jews, what we might call Haredi and, and uh, various other forms of being, you know, of, of observant Jews. This was, again, not her family. Um, and that's a huge part of the appeal. And another, and the other aspect of this is that this is a very familiar story for non-Jews. And that's because it's about a murdered Jew who offers us absolution from our sins. And here's what I mean by that. The reason for the appeal of that, of her diary is because of it, a lot of it rests on this line that she has toward the end of the book, the end of the, of the end of her diary, the end of her life, where she writes, I still believe in spite of everything that people are truly good at heart. And this is the line that is like on the book jacket. It's on your test when you have to, you're obligated in school to read this book and take a test about it. Um, it's on the walls of the museums. And, you know, it's, we take this to be inspiring. And by inspiring, we mean it's flattering to non Jewish societies because it makes people feel forgiven for these, you know, lapses in their civilization that lead to piles of murdered Jews, right? I mean, it's like, and if a murdered Jew said this, it must be true. And that's sort of this like mental thing that people do with this is they hold this up as they're like, this is like, oh, look how this person, despite all odds, still held out her faith in humanity. The reality though of that line in the diary is so much simpler. Like Anne Frank wrote that line about people being truly good at heart three weeks before she met people who weren't. Three weeks after she writes that line, she's arrested, taken to Westerbork and then to Auschwitz. And you know what? She met people there who weren't truly good at heart. I mean, that's like literally the simple explanation. Like who had she met before that? Her family? The extraordinarily exceptional people who were protecting her family? Those are the only people she had contact with. So yeah, she believed people were really good at heart. And guess what? Three weeks later, she met people who weren't. And that part's not in the book. So that is, I mean, so this becomes a story that's very, very satisfying for a non-Jewish public. And it is, I am, I'm going to say it out loud, it is a very resonant story for, you know, um, a lot of the Christian public because it's, you know, they're very used to this, there's this ingrained thing they have in their, in their tradition where there's this like tortured and murdered innocent Jew who died for, who died to absolve them of their sins. I don't think that's a coincidence. So that's some of the problems with that. But I, I, you know, another big problem to me is especially because in highlighting this person who had, um, you know, fairly, fairly limited, uh, you know, ex, you know, fair, who was fair, who, who was, um, I'm gonna say that again. Um, part of the problem is uh, in, ex, you know, in highlighting this person who is uh, living a largely non-Jewish Western life, is, it's also part of the erasure of Jewish civilization. And this is something, I don't talk about this in the book, but I, I have a podcast called Adventures with Dead Jews, which goes a little beyond the book. And I tell some of the, I, I do talk about this there. Um, there's something similar at the, the Holocaust Museum here in the United States in Washington, DC. They have a children's exhibit called Daniel's Story. And you, it's, it's sort of set up, it's like a mock house where you walk into this house of this sort of fictitious uh, uh, or composite, I guess, German Jewish boy in Frankfurt, Germany. And, you know, you go into his bedroom and you see his like swim trophies from his swim team on the wall. And you go into, you know, you see his after school snacks and you see like, you know, his father was a war hero and you see his father's war medals from the German army. And then after that, you, you know, you go to his room in the ghetto or, and, and, and so forth. But um, I remember, I, I actually covered the opening of that museum when it opened in 1993 for a teen magazine. Um, which sent me there to, uh, I was, I was 16 and I was sent to cover this museum. And I remember coming back from that exhibit and talking to people in my own Jewish community about it, people who hadn't yet seen this museum that had just opened, um, you know, not, not very close to where I live. And I remember speaking about it with a Holocaust survivor in my community and saying how I thought this 
exhibit was this children's exhibit was so powerful because it you know showed American children that like oh people who you know kids who died at the Holocaust were just like them and I will I'll remember this the rest of my life this woman became enraged at me and just started screaming at me what if they weren't just like them would it have been okay to murder them if they weren't just like them and she raised all these points she's like you know why do we have this kid's trophies from the swim team in his bedroom why don't we have I mean there's ways you could go with this why don't we have maybe his copies of the Mishnah or why don't we have his songbooks from, you know, his Zionist youth club, Hashomer Hatzair? Or why don't we have his, you know, his um, uniform from his, you know, Yiddish speaking socialist, uh, you know, youth group, right? Why do we have dad's war medals instead of dad's tefillin? Or why don't we have dad's tickets to the Yiddish theater? I mean, it's like, if she even asked, she's like, is there even a mezuzah on the door of Daniel's house? And like, I actually recently checked and no, there isn't. And, you know, I mean, and, it was just you know, what you realize is like, you know, the Nazi project was not just about, you know, killing six million innocent people. It was about erasing Jewish civilization. What I realized was that the museum was actually participating in that erasure. And that's what's happening with the presentation of Anne Frank's diary as a typical Holocaust narrative also is participating in that erasure because, you know, the the horror of the Holocaust is not just about, you know, six million innocent boys and girls who were on a swim team. It's also about the destruction of Jewish civilization. And, you know, there's no appreciation of that. It's like, you know, we only care about these people if they're just like me and you. And then if it turns out if they're not just like me and you, then it's like apparently totally fine to kill them. Uh, do you think this is a, a you know, it's, as I promote my Jewish history um, podcast and, and these interviews, so I, you know, one of the ways I, I do it is I connect to um, Holocaust museums and people who are in the Holocaust space. And I'm always amazed how many Holocaust museums there are in every single city. It's just, you know, it's, and, and I and I interviewed a, a renowned, I don't have to mention the name, a renowned Jewish historian. I asked him about this. I said, you know, but does it help? You know, it, it's, it, it sounds like it's a very positive thing. There's, it raises tremendous awareness of what happened. Um, maybe it helps stem or doesn't stem anti-Semitism. And, and his response was, there, there, there's some, something positive about it. He, he said, my sense is a lot of it is to assuage guilt. Simply to, you know, to relieve people of whatever of guilt they might feel because of whatever. I don't, I don't know, you know. Wait, so it, was he refer? I was, I don't, it, it referring to people in the Jewish community who, you know, uh, yes. supported Yes. So, okay. Yeah. So it's not, Jewish, not about the Jewish, and, Jewish and non-Jewish community, I would think, but yes, including the Jewish community. Yes. So I, I actually now, since I, if this is after I published this book, I actually now have an enormous amount of insight into this because I happen to have spent the last year uh, doing a project. I was commissioned by uh, the Atlantic, which is another general interest American magazine. They commissioned me to do a long project for them. You know, long, like, it's like, you know, I don't know, 10,000. It's one of those, you know, when you read a magazine article that goes on forever and ever and ever, and you're like, when is this going to end? Like one of those. Um, I, you know, wrote a long, I, they commissioned me to do a really long piece for them about American Holocaust education. And uh, suffice it to say that the headline of this, piece that they pub they published this uh, over uh, it was right before Pesach so it was a few months ago um, and I did not choose the headline but the headline of this piece is is Holocaust education making anti-semitism worse um, I've now done an enormous amount of research into this and I will tell you a few things that I noticed and I'm going to highlight in our conversation some things that I mentioned in the article but are not like really highlighted um, because I was writing for you know a general audience and you know I think there's it's there's a little bit of a different emphasis for a Jewish audience um, but one of the things I noticed I mean so when I say I, I, I wrote about this I didn't just like visit museums like I I mean, I did go to museums around the country, as you said, like these many museums in many, many cities. Um, I also, you know, not all of which made it into the piece. Um, I also, it wasn't just that, I also interviewed people who were involved in creating these museums. I interviewed, um, you know, uh, state legislators who passed these like Holocaust education mandates that we have in a lot of states in the United, uh, United States right now. Um, I spoke to uh, educators. I went to teacher training workshops. Um, you know, I went to teacher conferences. Um, I met with people who create curriculums for schools to teach this. 
Um, so it was very, very extensive. And, and, and I also read a lot of um, social science research, um, it, you know, sort of tracking the impact of this. So I, I spent a lot of time on this. And I will tell you, so first of all, of the hundreds of people that I interviewed for this giant piece, most of which didn't make it into the piece, but of the hundreds of people I interviewed who work in the field of Holocaust education in the United States, I can count on one hand how many people I interviewed who were Jewish. The people who run these museums are not Jewish. The people who create the curricula are not Jewish. Um, I mean, I remember being at this in the Dallas Holocaust Museum. I was there for a, a teacher conference. It was for high school teachers from all over Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas. It was a multi-day conference in the summer training these teachers um, to teach the Holocaust in their classrooms. Um, I was at this conference um, with these, you know, I think it was like, I forget how many, 50 or 80 teachers, something like that. Um, and also all the facilitators for the conference, people who are training these teachers, people who work at the museum, people who are historians. And at one point I looked around at this conference and I realized that other than the holograms of, you know, which now they have these holograms of Holocaust survivors that are like, you know, created with AI and all this. I looked around, and I thought, other than the holograms, I'm the only Jew in this building. And that's quite typical, very typical. And I, so this, you know, so what you're saying about like assuaging guilt and this kind of thing, like, and that was true a generation ago, that's not who's there now. There's, you know, probably still the funding, but even the funding I've noticed in like this Dallas Museum, like the CEO of the Dallas Holocaust Museum is a woman named Mary Pat Higgins. And I remember they, the museum had hired her from some prep school as a fundraiser. And she was bragging to me about how now, you know, only, only 30% of our funding comes from Jewish sources, you know, because she had managed to get all these corporations or whatever to donate to this museum. So, I mean, if this is like, you know, totally jump the shark, as we say in the United States, in terms of being like a Jewish story in the United States, like it's like, and what I discovered, though, is that is the fallout of that, which is that, first of all, data about does this prevent anti Semitism? Short version, no, Holocaust education does not prevent anti Semitism. Um, I can go into the details of the data, but it's a it's uh, let's just say yeah there's there's zero evidence that Holocaust education prevents anti Semitism. Um, another bigger problem, though, in my mind, is that there's this is the only thing that most people in America know about Jews. To the extent that uh, I remember speaking to those same docents in that in that Dallas Holocaust Museum, and one of the docents. I remember speaking with him and asking him, you know, when students come through the museum, what do they typically ask? Because I was there, you know, I was there in the summer when there weren't any students. And he said, you know what students ask at this museum? He said, they ask, are there still Jews who are alive today? Because if you went to this museum, you wouldn't know. And I mean, that's very typical in the United States. I mean, I know this is, you know, outside of Israel, we're the most, uh, we're the biggest Jewish community in the world, but we're, but in, but America's a gigantic country. We're only like 2% of the population. Most Americans never meet living Jews and they know absolutely nothing. So, so, I mean, this, this sounds like it's just, it's ignorance. I mean, they probably don't know. Yes. Anything. They don't know anything about, I don't know, uh, Eskimos, um, you know, is, is, is it, it so, so what's the issue here? Though? Is it, okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes, that, that is true. So they don't write. I mean, it's like, you know, if, if I say like, oh, to look at this high school history textbook, what does it say about Jews? The only thing it says is that they died in the Holocaust. And you're like, well, so yes, one rebuttal to that is like, well, there are probably a lot of people who aren't in that high school history book. You know, the Yazidis are not in that high school history book either. Here's the problem with that argument. The Yazidis are not foundational to the history of Western civilization. Judaism is foundational to the history of Western civilization. You can't understand Western civilization without understanding Judaism. Can't understand Christianity, can't understand Islam, can't understand like, you know, the Enlightenment, all these other movements, nationalism. I mean, like it, none of it makes sense if you know nothing about Judaism. And the erasure of Jews from that story is part of this, you know, is, is part of the problem and is evidence of the problem. Because if you put Jews into that story, it would like ruin the whole rest of the story. That we're trying to teach children so i mean so that's to me that's one of the huge problems um another piece is like well there are probably a lot of people we don't know about well it's like if the reason we're teaching about the holocaust is to prevent anti-semitism 
I mean, the first step in preventing anti-Semitism today would maybe be for people to know that there are still Jews who are alive today. I mean, that, that you'd think that would be kind of basic to understanding this. And also like, you know, understanding who Jews are, because that's another thing that I've noticed, like, I mean, there are now, I forget what number, it's like 27 or something of 50 states in the United States require Holocaust education in school. I mean, and it should be, you know, I mean, I, I wanna be clear, I'm not against Holocaust education. Like, I mean, I think everyone should learn about this in school, um, but, there's not a single state in the United States where anyone has to learn in school who are Jews. And I mean, that's why, as you say, there's a lot of ignorance. I mean, the good news is there's a lot more ignorance than malice. And that's one of the things I've discovered after publishing this book and speaking around the United States with both Jewish and non-Jewish audiences. And I could say more about that, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, but I wanna, the, the bigger sort of underlying issue, I think with these Holocaust uh, education initiatives, and especially now that they're mostly, really, frankly, mostly run by people who aren't Jewish. Um, and this, I didn't say in the article because it was like a little bit, it was a little bit too much. Um, is that this, what this non-Jewish world has done with the, with the, with the story of the Holocaust is very consistent with what the non-Jewish world has always done with stories of Jewish experiences for thousands of years, which is you take a Jewish experience, claim that it happened to everyone, and then point out that like, you know, living Jews are, are like completely irrelevant and kind of ruin the story. I mean, the church did this for thousands of years, you know, we're the new Israel. I mean, Islam did this, you know, we have the real prophecy. I mean, this is just like, this is, again, it's, I don't think, it's not conscious. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, just like the thing with Anne Frank being this Jesus figure is not conscious. I don't think it's conscious, but this is just such a deep, um, this is such a deep groove in Western thinking that people aren't even like considering what they're doing when they're thinking this way. And, and what was the, I'm sure it's very, what was the response to the book and as you went around the country and you know people who had read the book what, what kind of response did you get was it encouraging discouraging you know mixed well it's actually kind of both but in a very very distinctly clear way um so the discouraging responses that i've gotten have the, or what's what has discouraged me has been the response i've gotten from jewish readers to this book um, and I will, I mean, I, this is my first nonfiction book. And so I was very not prepared for this. Um, you know, I've had, I've been inundated with, with, uh, responses from Jewish readers. And when I say Jewish readers, I mean, people from many, many walks of life. So, you know, religious people, secular people, people from, you know, old people, young people, people from big communities, small communities, people from the United States, people from around the world. And it's like every single Jewish reader tells me exactly the same thing. It's like, it's like they're all filling out a template. Um, they all say, I felt uncomfortable my whole life and I never understood why. Your book articulated this for me, thank you. And then they say, I never told anyone this before, but, and then they tell me like some long horror story of their own experiences with anti-Semitism. And I mean, I will tell you, like, I wrote this book as an intellectual exploration. Like, it's not really about my own life. And that's not how my readers read it. Because everyone is just like pouring out these like truly horrible stories to me. They took it personally. Yes. And, 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 and like came to me and, you know, then they're like, they tell me these horror stories. Sometimes it's in person when I do events around the United States. They'll, you know, but sometimes, it, you know, they write me an email or, you know, I actually don't have much, I, I try to avoid social media. So I'm sure people are sending me stuff there too that I'm not even seeing, but um, people- It's a wise, it's a wise decision. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it's, I wish it were a wise decision. It's more just like a logistical decision, but you know, when I was, you know, I have four children and when they were, when they were younger, it was just impossible. And then I kind of missed that boat, but um, yeah, no, there's probably a lot I'm not seeing, but you know, I, I, you know, people contact me in any, in various ways, or they, uh, you know, they kind of, you know, collar me at events. 
and you know just telling me this like massive horror stories um which often involve physical violence i mean these are not like it wasn't just like oh here's a mean thing somebody said to me 20 years ago like it's not that like i mean it's like you know, I was stabbed on my way to shul. <laughs> like, it's not, like, I mean, really, like, you know, like, they're not, like, you know, um, you know, I've, uh, my boss harasses me every day at work. I mean, like, you know, kids are throwing pennies at me on the school bus every single day. Wow. Like, it isn't just like, oh, here's a mean thing someone said to me 20 years ago, which is just, you know, part of being alive. I mean, this is like things like that are consistent harassment and abuse. Um, and then they say, thanks for writing your book. Right, and sometimes they're like, and some it's even worse is when they say like, "Can you help?" I mean, like, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> like, I'm a novelist. I didn't know how to respond to this. But then the thing that actually has been encouraging to me, though, has been responses I've gotten from non-Jewish readers. Because, um, and I've spoken, to, you know, I've gotten, I do a lot of events that are, I do events that are like for the Jewish community, but I do a lot of events also that are like you know, broader, for a broader public and often those, you know, whether it's at a university or if it's a, you know, corporation or bookstore or literary festivals, things like that. And a lot of times those events will be in parts of the country that just don't have very many Jews. And so, you know, 90% of the audience is not Jewish. I've also done, I mean, I've been interviewed on, you know, here in the United States, we have a lot of like, you know, Christian TV stations. Um, I've also been interviewed on some of their non-Jewish minority groups often have their own media outlets like podcasts and things like that and I've been interviewed for a number of those as well and you know I, oh and I also have been sucked into occasionally sometimes I do these like corporate D, what we call DEI which is like diversity equity and inclusion events this is like a trendy thing in the United States in the last few years um so I've done a few of those what I have discovered is that there's there's just a whole lot of people non-Jewish people in the United States with an enormous amount of goodwill toward the Jewish community. And these people really want to be like good friends to the Jewish community and to support the Jewish community in any way they can. And they basically usually just don't know how. Like they don't know where to go. And the other thing I, and so, I mean, that's what I mean when I say there's so much more ignorance than malice. Like people truly know nothing at all. And often they're coming to you with their own lens, right? Like, I mean, how many times have I sat down for some interview with a Christian radio station where they're like, we have a member of the chosen people here with us. And I'm like, okay, because that's where we're going. Like, oh, sure. Okay, we're going there. Um, you know, so I mean, they're often, you know, framing it in their own way. But um, there's a lot of like genuine goodwill. And genuine, and the other thing is genuine curiosity. That's what I find most often among my non-Jewish readers is like people who really want to know the answer to that question, like who are Jews? Like, what does it mean to be Jewish? Because like they, they, they don't have any source of information. Um, I mean, you know, what do they know about Jews? They know they died in the Holocaust. You know, maybe they heard that Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> that's like kind of all, that's kind of all they got. Um, and there are groups in the United States in Jewish organizations that are sort of pushing back against this. I'm actually now doing a research project about some of these groups that sort of go into, you know, Jewish organizations that go into public school settings in places where there are like no Jews and, uh, you know, sort of basically just sort of try to educate them on like basics of Jewish identity. And this is the extent of the ignorance. I will tell you, I was, I just sat in on one of these classroom things uh, a couple of weeks ago for, it was some school in rural Wisconsin where, you know, there's no Jews. And it was this woman from the Jewish community in Minneapolis who was doing this presentation and part of her presentation, she had like a bunch of words she put up on a slide and it was, you know, things like Shabbat and, you know, I don't remember, you know, things like, you know, Shabbat, Israel, whatever, you know, sort of these like basic terms in Jewish life. And she just sort of asked, it was sort of just trying to be interactive and just first just asked the kids like, you know, pick a word on this board that you either do know or don't know. And, you know, then, you know, ask your questions about it. And I, I mean, I just remember this one girl raises her hand and she says, what is Zionism? Like, this is how little these people knew that they, I mean, here we're all worried about, oh, people are anti-Zionist. Like, literally never heard the word before. <laughs> never heard of it. What is Zionism? <laughs> never heard anyone say this word before in my life. And so, I mean, this is like, I mean, to me, though, this is an opportunity because you know there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of goodwill so i think that there is an opportunity to sort of change the way people think about this how does this opportunity this goodwill and this these encouraging responses uh how does that 
jive with, you know, there's a sense um, among certain groups in the Jewish community that the last place in the world you want to send your child to is a American university, that it has just become dangerous almost, you know, you know just, just a, a dangerous place intellectually, physically. I mean, that's, that's kind of like, you know, a perception that some people in, in the Jewish community have. So, how, you know, it, and a lot of it, of course, is expressed in terms of uh, anti-Zionism, Israel, but the sense is maybe it's more than than just that. So how, how do you how do you like jive that together with this encouragement and then what we are hearing about what's happening in in you know in the class? And now you see this you see this training already in high schools. If your child is going to go to you know a university somewhere, you better train them. You know, if they, especially if they came from a a um, a private Jewish education and they've never been exposed to this. Is that is that an issue? Do you see this as an issue? I mean, you're okay, out so, there in the campuses. Yeah, no, I, I speak at colleges around the country, so I'm very aware of this. Um, I will tell you that uh, my family kind of solved this problem for in in one in one way, which is that uh, I my oldest daughter just started college like a month and a half ago, and she's at Brandeis. Okay. Um, which is uh, I don't know if your listeners know much about it. It's a historically Jewish college, and. Uh, it's uh let's just say that yeah they don't have this problem at all people are hanging israeli flags in their dorm rooms and okay. windows and yeah this yeah you know, the the school calendar is the jewish calendar every yuntif they're closed i mean at that school you almost feel out of place if you're not jewish so although weirdly the majority of students are not jewish um interestingly um but yeah so we we there it's not true that there are like no friendly campuses but i mean yeah brandeis is certainly the exception um but I will tell you, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of schools that I have visited um, doing these events where, yeah, there's a huge problem. Um, I'm going to give tell you one story that just sort of encapsulates it. Um, I spoke at a uh, University of California, Santa Cruz uh, last year, and I remember that um, they, about two weeks before my visit to campus, unrelated to my visit to campus, but about two weeks before my visit to their campus, they had a... Um, they, they, someone had tried to put a uh, pass a resolution in their student government against anti Semitism and it was voted down. And having decided that they were not against anti Semitism, they apparently decided they were in favor of anti Semitism because then, like, uh, I was like two or three days before I got to campus, the buildings on campus are all like spray painted with swastikas. And I remember when I got to this campus, the person, the professor hosting me was telling me about this. And you know they had just cleaned these off before I got there, and I asked her, "Do you think that this was done by students or was it by people, you know, from this town?" And she said, "Oh, it was definitely stu. We definitely feel it was students." And I said, "How? What makes you think that?" And she's, I, I can't even say this without laughing. She's like, "Because we found the empty spray paint, paint, because we found the empty spray paint cans in the recycling bin." So I guess the philosophy is like, you know, kill the Jews and save the turtles. Um, yeah, I've seen this in a lot of places, but I will tell you that it's actually worse than that because it's also happening in K-12 schools. Um, and in the K-12 schools, it's less about the anti, it's not the so much the anti-Zionist stuff, although it is that too, it depends on different parts of the country, depends what's going on, but um, there's, it's, um, it's something that's happening in K to 12 schools very commonly. And it, you know, there's um, a lot of it is inspired by social media. Um, I mean, something like this, my kids go to public school, something like this happened in my kids middle school last year. Um, and it was, you know, much more just like straight up anti-Semitism. It's not like filtered through Israel or anything like that. And, and I mean, my kids live in, I mean, we live in a school with a giant Jewish community. Um, but I, there are parts of the country, it's much, the much more common problem in the United States is not this anti-Israel thing, which is, um, you know, it's, like I said, most people in the country are like, what is Zionism? Right. <laughs> um, you know, what's much more common is just this like old school stuff. I mean, I just spoke at, um, I just was speaking uh, just, you know, before Yontif, um, on it in, um, it was actually, I spoke in a giant sukkah in, Plano, Texas, and there are all these uh, teenagers there um, from whatever their youth group was, and a lot of them were kids who go to public school, 
And these are kids who are like, you know, one of 10 kids in their public school who's Jewish. And apparently for these kids, like, it's, this is just like old school anti-Semitic harassment is just very normal. And when I say old school, I mean, you know, people, Hitler saluting them and throwing pennies at them and checking for their horns. I mean, like, you know, really like old school stuff is like, that's like, you know, and then also, you know, yelling at them about Jesus or something. I mean, this is like the much more common thing. And uh, yeah, and that's a much more common American experience. But I mean, that's, but it has, it has definitely gotten worse at K to 12 schools. So in a sense, those kids who are coming from the Jewish school and that are being like prepped to go to college, like the kids from the public schools are way more prepared because right. they're not going to like be freaked out by this because they've seen it before. And they're just like, yeah, okay, now you know who your friends are. You know, they don't think of it as like, this is the whole school. They think of it as like, okay, I know who my friends are. And they're not these 10 kids. Right. I mean, it's just it's like, it's, they're, they're coming to it with a more, you know, more realism in a sense, like the way that our ancestors experienced this. Um, I mean, that's why, to me, that's what's most disturbing. It's like, this is, and I mean, and this goes to the events of this week. I mean, these are things that we may not be prepared for, but our ancestors were, you know, this was very familiar to them. And it's very familiar to, yeah, I don't know, kids in these high schools too. Do you think the events of this week are, 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 are going to be play a prominent role in, in some of the things that you're doing that some of the educators are doing? Is it is it is it you know something that can bring out you know some of the optimism that you um, you know that you, that you have expressed? I mean, yeah. So look, since this happened, I mean, I have been had a lot of people coming to me and you know, asking me what I think is a good idea of what I think they should do. And when I say people coming to me, I mean, um, people who want, who are like, we want to talk to our kids about this. How can we do this? Right. And, you know, what should this public school be doing as a program? And I've had people say to me like, oh, we want to bring a Holocaust survivor to the school to talk about. It. I was like, not really relevant. Then we're sending the message to all these kids like, oh, here's a thing that happened 80 years ago rather than here's a thing that happened five days ago. Why are we pretending that this didn't happen five days ago? Right. If you wanna bring somebody to speak to the school, how about somebody who can talk about what happened five days ago? I mean, there's this denial of reality or this like unwillingness to admit that we're in a new reality. And that is, but I do think that now there's sort of, that is starting to change. Um, because yeah, I've had a lot of people who've been asking me about this. Um, I mean, Jewish community is incredibly united at this moment, which is kind of really amazing, <laughs> especially if you think about where we were about a week ago. <laughs> um, yeah, there's uh, it's the Jewish community is incredibly united. I mean, it is remarkable to me how, you know, I don't know if it's the words of our ancestors, um, but I mean, I feel like everybody I, I've encountered in the Jewish community, and it doesn't matter if they're religious or not religious or, or how involved they are, if they're, um, I mean, everybody instantly knows the, you know, the, the impact of what's happened and that it involves them. And I think the good news is that here in the United States, we do have already these relationships with our non-Jewish neighbors. I mean, I, will, I had mentioned earlier, you know, that I had been at this event with 2000 people that was for the Jewish community was, you know, in solidarity with, you know, the, with people in Israel. And we had members of Congress who were there who were not Jewish from both parties. And they all spoke about their experiences and their dedication to the Jewish community. So, I mean, and I know that that has happened around the country. Um, and I do think that there is sort of people are making more space for changing this conversation and are suddenly aware of the impact of you know the the impact of this like phenomenon that I described of people of dead Jews. So um, I, I, I think that yes there there's I mean I, I cannot predict the future. Um, and obviously I am praying for uh, 
praying for you know peace and uh and and oh, for yeah. the re return of the hostages and for all of those things um and there's and there's no but after that sentence <laughs> um you know we're all doing everything we possibly can and uh we will um i mean the one thing that's comforting about jewish history is that through it all we're all still here yes yes okay so again there's not much more to be said at this point and um again uh dara horn people love dead jews reports from a haunted presence and um and encourage all our listeners and viewers uh, to go on um, and purchase the book and um again thank you so much and um, we should only hear good news yes Sorotovot. Sorotovot. okay thank you so much thank you thank you